Wow. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good, is he not? Amen. This is awesome, preaching in the shadow of the cross. This is where every pastor needs to stand when they preach, is in the shadow of the cross. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, to begin with, I want to share with you a passage from a book that a dear friend gave to me last year for Christmas. And she could give this book to me because she knew that I would not take offense to this book. The name of it is God's Answer to Fat. (laughs) Do you know what God's answer to fat is? Lose it. It's written by an awesome lady. Her name is Frances Hunter. She's had a healing ministry. She and her husband, Charles, travel the world. Thousands of people have been healed under their ministry, and they've both gone on now to be with the Lord. But I want to read an excerpt. It's actually on the back of the book. And this describes my life. Maybe some of you in here tonight. I've been on every kind of diet. Anybody ever tried every kind of diet you can think of? I've been on the water diet. I've been on the grapefruit diet. You remember the grapefruit diet? Mm-hmm. How many of y'all tried the grapefruit diet? You remember that? I've been on a banana diet. I've been on a solid diet. I've been on a fruit salad diet. I've been on an egg diet. I've been on a high-protein diet. Remember Atkins diet? Anybody try Atkins diet? Yeah, let's don't lie to not people. We know there's more in the house that's done that. (laughs) I've been on a low-protein diet. I've been on a no-carbohydrate diet. And here's my favorite. I've been on all-carbohydrate diet. Give me all the bread and taters. I've tried all kinds of exercising machines. I've gone to spas and had myself absolutely pummeled and beaten to death. I have ridden on stationary bicycles until I was so sore and tired that I could hardly get home. I've been literally shaken to pieces by electric belts. (laughs) Oh, y'all know people that's done that, right? (laughs) I have laid on machines which roll and bump and thump and make you black and blue. I have baked in saunas, wet and dry, until I was so weak I had to eat a hot fudge sundae to get up enough strength (laughs) to get home. Oh, yes. Give me a spoonful of peanut butter. I have stood in scalding whirlpool baths until I nearly had heat exhaustion. I've lost 20,000 pounds in my lifetime and have successfully managed to gain them all back. (laughs) Now, how many of you does that story fit your life in some way or another? You've tried every gimmick and every way to reach some kind of result that you wanted in your life. And what I love right now is when you go to Walmart or you go to Kmart or you go to Kroger, what are you going to find right as you walk in the door? You're going to find all this exercise equipment, workout clothes. You're going to find the right food to eat. Because right now is when we're all making up our New Year's resolutions that we're going to lose weight, right? Yeah. Last about an hour until you get hungry. <laughs> and then you make some of these resolutions. I want to get my house organized. So they got all these storage containers and, you know, file folders. And I've done that. Bought them all home and neatly stacked them in my office. And that's where I left them. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My family and I have started to diet together today. And oh boy. So if I'm a little grouchy, I'm sorry, but I hadn't had any sugar, and I haven't had any bread, and I hadn't had any taters today. I'm from Mississippi. We call them taters. So I'm a little on edge tonight, or maybe it's the spirit. But you know what? Something that the Lord has been speaking in my spirit lately is this. We all make New Year's resolutions that we seem to never carry out. Would you agree? And so I ask God... Why can we never carry out these resolutions of ours that we want to to accomplish? And you know what he spoke into my spirit the other day just so loud and clear was this. 
because they're not my resolutions. They're yours. How many of us honestly sit down and say, Lord, will you show me what it is that you have for me in this year? What is it that you want me to do in the upcoming year? I believe if we would honestly sit down and ask God to show us what is it that you want me to do in 2013, He's going to download that resolution into your life, and it's going to be a lot easier to complete that task because it's mandated from Him. And when He mandates a call on our life, He's going to give us the strength and the ability to carry that out. Amen? It's a lot easier to accomplish a task when it's God's task on your life and not your own. And so tonight as we come together and we begin discussing our first fruits, I think what God is going to ask us to do tonight before this night is over is for us to come together and surrender our own resolutions before Him. Give those up to Him and say, God, will you download your resolution into my life? So I hope you're ready for that. Tonight there are four things that God has spoken to my heart that I want to share with you. Four resolutions that we all need to have. Are you ready? Yes, sir. If you got pencil and paper, you might want to write these down. Number one. Now, this is a biggie. Okay? Number one. You're going to be weird. <laughs> Everybody get that? You're going to be weird. Now, talk about being weird... I'm not talking about like my childhood growing up. You see, when I was in fourth grade, I was as big as around as I was tall, and I had a hard time keeping my pants pulled up. <laughs> so mom wanted to give me double protection. So she made me wear a belt, and she bought me a pair of suspenders for every day of the week. <laughs> Could you imagine a little butterball going to school with a pair of suspenders on? Could you only imagine the humiliation that I went through? Could you imagine the bruises I had on my back because of the suspenders that I had to wear? <laughs> Not really talking about that kind of weird tonight, okay? Nor am I talking about the kind of weird that my mother and father were going to graciously buy me a vehicle. Was it my senior year of high school, Steph? Yes. Birthday present. Well, you'll never guess what was the first car they went and looked at. A hearse. Dad said, if I buy you a hearse, nobody will want to ride with you. <laughs> and you won't want to drive it. And so after I cried a few tears, Mom and Dad passed up on that one, and they went and bought me a 1987 Plymouth Horizon. Does anybody remember the Plymouth Horizons? The little four-door hunchback cars? But it wasn't like black or silver or white. It was smurf blue. And the seats were a little torn, so mom and dad bought me matching seat covers to go into the car that were Smurf blue. You know, I mean, it was just awesome. This car was so weird. If you got to a speed bump, you couldn't slow down. You had to speed up to get over it. <laughs> you see, I would take my brother, my little brother, which is six foot eight. He's younger than him. He's six foot eight, 300 pounds. Um, he would ride with me and my wife. And my cousin, who's about my size, in the car every morning to school. And our school had these speed mountains, is what we called them. They weren't speed bumps, they were mountains. And so in order for us to get over those speed mountains, I would have to literally speed up and go as fast as I possibly could. And we would hit that mountain, and we would jump up in the air, and we would hit, the muffler would hit in the back, and be sparks going down the road. <laughs> Try to keep a smile on my face. Everybody else was ducking. Then Steph and I would go on dates together in that wonderful little Smurf. And if you parked on the least little incline, you couldn't get the gear out of, get it out of park. And so Stephanie would have to get out of the car, and she'd have to go behind the car, and she would have to start rocking the car back and forth <laughs> so we could get the car into reverse. That's not the weird I'm talking about. 
What I'm talking about is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. We are called to be a weird people in the world's eyes. Do you hear me? The church is called to be a peculiar people within the world. But the problem is Satan has desensitized us so much that you can hardly pick out a Christian from a worldly person. Exactly right. You know what I'm saying? And this is a year that I think God is going to call the church to step up and be a different people. I mean, look at what's going on in the news right now. I mean, I hate to preach politics. I'm not going to do that tonight. But if things continue going on in the government as they are, the church is going to have to step up to the plate. And people are going to have to start coming back to the church. We are called to be a people that are set apart. We are called to be a different people. A while ago, we were singing that song, Oh, How He Loves Us. And it was talking about the, the trees being bent by the winds of the hurricane. Growing up in South Alabama and South Mississippi for most of my life, I've been a witness to many hurricanes. And I've watched pine trees in our front yard literally bend from one side all the way over to the other side. The top of the tree touched the ground on the left, and it would swing over and touch the ground on the right. And then it would come back up and it would go to the front and touch, and it would go to the back and touch, and never pop. God wants to do that with us. God wants us to be a people that are willing to say, God, here I am. Make me different. Blow me to the left. Blow me to the right. Blow me to the front. Blow me to the back. I'll go any direction you want me to go. I'll do whatever you want me to do. Even if I'm considered weird. My family, look at, my family looks at us now and they scratch their heads sometimes and say, Where, what are you doing? What do you mean? That you left a secure employment, a promise of an income, a promise of benefits, a promise of a house for the rest of your ministry. You left that to go out and start a church of your own. What are you thinking, Troy? I'm not thinking. God's thinking. And God's going to show his glory through the weird things that he's called me into. Are you willing to be that person that God's going to use to be different? I want us to look at Revelations chapter 1, verse 6. This is talking about Jesus, and it says, Jesus has made us to be a kingdom. Do you understand that Jesus gave his life so that every one of you could be a king and a queen in his kingdom? Do you realize that? That royal blood flows through your veins. It is no longer just everyday blood. But the king gave his life and spilt his own blood. So now that royal blood flows through your veins. You are the kings and the queens of his kingdom. But it's unlike any king and queen that you'll ever meet on this side of life. Because he says not only are we called to be a kingdom... But we're called to be priest, to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. You know that song that we sing sometimes, we fall down? We lay our crowns where? At the feet of Jesus. I grew up hearing the theology taught, get the jewels for your crown. Get the jewels for your crown. So when you get to heaven, you'll have a crown. And one day I was singing that song, and praise God, he downloaded a vision into my spirit 
that yes, I'm getting those crowns with those jewels as a king in his kingdom so that when I get before his mighty throne, I'm going to bow down and take that crown off and lay it at his feet. It's not for me to wear, but it's for me to put it down at his feet, brother. That's a different view than what the world has. The world has to view, get every crown you can, get every accolade that you can, get all that you can so that you can make something of yourself. But my God has called me to be a weird person, to get every accolade I can, to get every crown that I can, to get everything that I can so I can take it off and lay it down at his feet and say it is yours, Jesus. This year, our God is calling us to be a weird people, a people who will take our crowns and lay them down at his feet. God's also led me in this past year in a, a different way of leading worship. I love to lead worship. I love to sit at the piano and play and, and sing and just lead God's people into his presence. But he showed me something this last year that I'm trying to take into this next year even more. You see, when those guys are on stage leading worship, they're really not ministering to you. That's right. Do you know who you're ministering to? Him. When they lead worship, they are not ministering to you, but they are ministering unto God. What was the priest's responsibility in the Old Testament? Was to minister unto God himself. You see, we are all called to minister unto God. And when we worship him, when we sing, when we pray, when we do his acts of service that he calls us to do, what you are doing, you are ministering unto God. Yeah, you might be reaching out to somebody, but Lord, it sure is blessing our daddy God in heaven. Mm -hmm. I want to be a peculiar people who is willing for God to call me to do whatever and me do it, regardless of how weird it might look. Do you want to be those weird people? Yes. Say, you're going to be weird. weird. Say, I'm going to be weird. Be weird. Okay, now along with that, all you got to grow mohawks, okay? Mohawks and <laughs> dye your hair 15,000 different colors. Okay, here we go. Number two, resolution. And I have been waiting to speak this word over Elkhorn. Because my brother came to the church that I was serving and spoke this word, and it wrecked my life. Number two, you're going to get drunk this year. On the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. You're going to get drunk on the Holy Ghost like never before. That is a resolution that God wants us to live out this year. Now, I want us to look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, I believe. It's one of the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be what? Filled. Awesome. God wants you this year to hunger and thirst for more of Him so that you shall be filled. That's right. Now, that's a good resolution. That's a resolution we all need to have. That's why God's speaking it tonight. The church, the body of Christ, needs to have a hunger and thirst for him like never before. Like never before. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Spirit. Now, when my brother came to our church a few years ago, he spoke that word, and he said, to be filled means, does anybody know? To get drunk on the Spirit. But in the Greek, it doesn't mean just the one time being filled or getting drunk on the Spirit. It means continuously being filled with the Holy Ghost day after day after day after day. Do you remember in Acts it said that they thought the apostles were what? Drunk at what time in the morning? 
Why, did they, why were they acting drunk? Because they were so filled with the Holy Ghost. They were so filled with the presence of God that they were really looking weird to everybody else. I had to tell you this story. When Brian came to our church a few years ago, he got up that night to preach, and we were in a little tin building called the Cedar Stage, had a hard cement floor. And Brian got up, and I could tell something was going on. You remember that night? Yeah, yeah. And he's like, God's changed my word. And, and he got up there, and he read this passage of Scripture, and he said, the Lord wants us to get drunk on the Holy Ghost. And he prayed over me, and guys, this is no lie. This big boy did a bend to where my head was almost on the floor. You remember that night? And I got so snockered in the Holy Ghost that I couldn't even hardly stand up. Has that ever happened to anybody here before? You ever just felt the presence of God so strong on you that you couldn't even stand up? Yes, sir. If you haven't, you need to get it tonight before you leave, and it's going to happen, I guarantee you. But here you go, okay? Because it's going to be released in this house in a little bit. Right. Is I was so drunk on the Holy Ghost that I couldn't even walk, and I got a phone call that one of my church members' grandmothers had just died, and they were at the hospital. Brother Troy, we need you. Well, I was like... <laughs> okay so this guy in my church named TJ he's like I'll take you Troy because I couldn't drive I mean I would have been pulled over for DUI driving under the influence of the Holy Ghost I don't know if they had that on the ticket but they would add anyways how would you pay a fine on that I mean what would that be you know yeah so anyways so here I walk into Westlake Hospital there in Columbia and I'm having a hold on the wall because I can barely walk and this family's in the chapel, and they're crying, and they open up the door, and like, I'm here. I love you. I wasn't asked to preach that funeral. But anyway, so um, God wants you to be filled with his spirit. Jesus gave his life on the cross. And he said, I'm going to my Father and one will follow. And the Holy Spirit came. And the Holy Spirit came with so many gifts and with the power of the Most High God. Jesus' life was given so that we could receive that. And when we refuse to accept all that comes along with the gift that flowed down from Calvary, to me, you might as well be spitting in the face of Jesus. Because you're saying the life that he gave, I don't want all of it, I just want part of it. It breaks my heart at Christmas time when I give my kids all these gifts and then wind up playing with a milk jug and a lid. I wonder if God ever looks down and says, I've given my son's life, but all you're playing with is a milk jug and a lid. God, get me drunk on your spirit. Get me drunk on your spirit. Fill me up every day like never before. Okay? Everybody got that? I'm going to be weird. I'm going to get drunk. Woo! Don't tell my principal. By the way, I teach eighth grade math. Don't tell my school board that. Okay, so um, here we go. Number three. Going to be weird, I'm going to get drunk. Number three, you're going to be a river maker. You're going to be a river maker. It's what God wants for this place. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of dead water. Is that what it says? The church sees, sees like it's dead water. It's the way they're living right now. The scripture has said streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. I want to go back to the slide before this please. Verse 38. Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. 
I love this passage of scripture because it says, those who are thirsty who come to him, the spring of living water shall flow from deep within him. And I believe that river should flow from deep within our gut, come all the way up and go right out of our mouths and to the lives of other people. Now, water has a lot of power. You know, water will beat and beat and beat against the rock, and it will beat and beat and beat against the earth. And over time, rivers normally do what? They get bigger, right? Because the water is constantly pounding against that rock. And it's pounding against that dirt. And it's making that river wider and wider and wider. And it's taking over more and more and more of the dry land. You see, there is a living river that flows from deep within us that wants to come out and go out into the world and beat against the hard yeah. hearts of this land. Yeah. Until they begin to break little by little. Now that river doesn't widen overnight, does it? It takes years and years and years. And I'm here to tell you right now, there are some people whose hearts are so hardened that it might not happen overnight. It might take years for that heart to become softened and a little by little be chiseled away. But I've got to let that living water which flows from deep within me to come out of me. But we have this thing where we want to stop it right here. And it's what Paul called quenching the Holy Spirit. Right? You ever feel something welling up inside of you has just got to come out? And because of pride, you stop it. What if that word was the word that would have changed that man's life sitting on the back row of the church today? What if your testimony had been that river that would have hit that person's life and changed them forever? But we stop that river from flowing. Don't be afraid. Let it flow. Who knows, it might be one big whack with your word and that person's life has changed forever. Think of my wife. Um, you see, when we dated, uh, we were poor. And um, we did anything that we could to raise money for a date. And back then, our date was to go to Ryan's Buffet. We could get all-you-could-eat buffet and two glasses of water for $14.99. And then we'd go to the mall, then walk the mall until it closed. And then we'd go to Walmart and walk it until I had to be home. And my curfew as a senior in high school was 10 o'clock. So kids don't complain when mama says 11 o'clock, okay? See, our news had this little thing that would come up at 10 o'clock and say, it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your kids are at? And my dad would say, yes, I do, he's in bed. You see, 10 o'clock was not sitting on the bench on the front porch courting. It wasn't sitting on the couch. It wasn't talking in the yard. It was, she's going to the house and you're in the bed. And so we did all these weird things to raise money to support our, our dating efforts. And so one day we were at church and, and this gentleman drove up and he said, um, are you looking to make some money, extra money? We we're like, yes. What do you want us to do? Well, you see my mom's grave out there in the cemetery. The church had a cemetery has a cement slab on it, and it's, it's, it's cracked, and I want you to break it up and cover it up with some dirt. So we thought, hey, hey here we go. We're going to make some money. So I go, and I get my dad's wheelbarrow, wheelbarrow, however you say it, <laughs> and a sledgehammer, and we're going to go, and I'm going to be this manly man, and I'm going to break up this slab on top of this grave, and Yeah. Make me about 50, 60 bucks. So we get there, and Stephanie is um, very vocal, and she said, um, give me the sledgehammer, I'm going to do it. <laughs> and I said, go ahead, baby, because I knew she'd just do one whack, and she'd be wore out, and I get to break the rest of it up. So she gets that sledgehammer, and she pulls it back. Wham! The cement slab breaks into about 300 pieces and falls three feet down. <laughs> Hits the top of the casket. For two days, we filled in that hole with my wheelbarrow with a flat tire. 
Because <laughs> in South Mississippi, it's red clay. And when red clay gets wet, it gets hard. We got paid $10. <laughs> he said, I got another one. You want to do it? And we said, no. She took that hammer and hit it one time and it broke. Who knows? Maybe that one time we let the river flow out of us, it could break those cement slabs that are covering people up and they could be set free. Amen. Let the river flow out of you. Let it flow out of you into the lives of other people. It wasn't meant to keep bottled up. That's right. The Holy Spirit was never meant for us to keep within ourselves, but to share it with others. The love of God was never meant to keep bottled up in our own heart, but to pour it out into the lives of other people. I teach eighth grade math, and I work with 100 kids every day. And probably 90% of those kids, what they need is just the love of God. They just need somebody to love them. Every day I'm wore out. And it's not from teaching but it's from loving on my kids. Now, one got in my face the other day, and I said, Zach, I've had enough of you. You're going to have to go out in the hallway. And he cried. I cried. All he wanted was for me to love on him. That's it. That's right. All he wanted me to do was love on him. Let the river flow. Let the love of God and the Holy Spirit flow out from deep within you. Okay, so I'm going to be weird. I'm going to get drunk. I'm going to be a river maker. Here's the next one, number four. John chapter 14, verse 12 says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Here's the fourth resolution for our year, 2013, is God's going to do greater things through us than what He'd done through Jesus. Now that's kind of hard to swallow, isn't it? Isn't that kind of hard to swallow that we will even be able to do greater things than what He done? I mean, He turned water into wine. He walked on water. He even brought Lazarus out of the grave, right? But yet Jesus himself said, if anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. But just not that, but greater things. Church, you are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. You are called to go out and do greater things than what he has done. You are called to go out and lay hands on the sick. And pray for them to recover and see it happen. You are called to go out and lay hands on those who are demon possessed and set them free from the demonic oppression and possession. And if you don't believe that demons are a real thing, we need to talk later. You are called to go out and set the captives free from whatever bondage they're in. You're even called to go out and raise up the dead. What if you get a call to go down to the funeral home for a mother who says, my child just died? Will you come down here and help me pray for her to raise up from the dead? How many of you would be willing to say, I'll be there? I tell you what, the Word says the enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And if my 12-year-old was taken out, I'm going to be calling some people to come help me pray over her because it's not her time to go yet. That's what we're called to do. But we might be considered weird if we go to the funeral home and pray for somebody to be raised from the dead. There was a guy named, um, what's his name, Wigglesworth. Smith. Smith. Smith Wigglesworth. Yes. He went to the funeral home. God told him to go to raise this guy up from the dead. So he went to the funeral home, went up to the casket, picked up the dead body, walked over and put him against the wall and said, I said in the name of Jesus, walk. What do you think happened? He fell. He fell. <laughs> so he picked them back up and said, I said in the name of Jesus, walk. And the man grabbed them by the arm and they walked out. Now, 
If I went to the local funeral home and picked up a dead body out of the casket and put it against the wall, I'm going to be weird. Going to be drunk. There might be some more dead people in the room we're going to have to raise up. It's like Jesse DePlantis said, Jesus could never go to a funeral. He always messed it up. You know? But I mean, is that not what Jesus did? And we're called to do the same thing. Too many people have died prematurely because we were afraid to say something. We are called to do greater things. Elkhorn Church, you are called to do greater things than what you were doing in 2012. Any other church that's represented here tonight, you are called to do more than what you were doing in 2012. And even bigger. And even better. And even reaching out farther than you've ever reached. Wow. So he's calling me to be weird. He's calling me to be drunk on the Holy Ghost. He's calling me to be a river maker. And he's calling me to do even greater things. Well, how am I going to do it? Why aren't we doing that already? These are things that God has been wanting his people to do from the very beginning. That's right. But why are we not doing those? I'm going to show you something the Lord showed me. Let's go to John chapter 11. Verses 38 through 44. Do you know what? In Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, it says that we as the body of Christ have been made complete in Him. It says that we have reached the fullness. That if you are a believer in Christ, everything you need is already inside of you. Because the Holy Spirit's there. You've been made complete. You realize that? But we as the church so many times look upon ourselves that we're without. I just don't have it yet. I don't have it yet. I need it. I need it. But it's there. Maybe this is the answer why we don't think we have it. Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. This is the story of Lazarus. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha... The sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. Is it the King James that says, he stinketh? I love that. <laughs> For he has been there four days. Now you see that, that four is very important because in the Jewish culture, they believed that the person's spirit really did not leave their body until after the third day. So up to the third day, you could come back from the dead, and that was normal, okay? So the fourth day, though, there was no chance. So Jesus really isn't late. He's just on time, as that song says, to show his glory. That Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? They've almost given up, haven't they? He's dead, he stinketh. But Jesus said, only if you, I told you if you would believe, you'd see the glory. How many times have we given up something in our life, given up on something or somebody? Amen. And the Lord's standing there saying, if you would only believe, you shall see my glory. Amen. Don't give up yet. Don't give up hope yet. Still believe. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, praise God. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Now I want to share with you what the Spirit has downloaded into me. Lazarus was bound hand and foot by these grave cloths. The cloth on his face typically could have been a piece of material wrapped around to keep his jaws closed. 
and a covering over his face so that you wouldn't see the ghastly appearance of a dead man. Okay? So he's been wrapped up. He's dead. He's put in that tomb. But when Jesus comes and says, take the stone away, and he calls him out, Lazarus does what? He comes back to life. So he's went to the dead side. Now he's back to the life side. And he's able to walk, but he still has what wrapped around him? His burial cloth. He has his face wrapped and a veil over his face. But undoubtedly he could still see some, so he knew what direction to go. Well, this is what the Lord spoke into my spirit. It was just as Lazarus went from the dead side to the life side. We who accept Christ have left death and we've come to life. But the problem is we still have some grave cloths wrapped around our feet and wrapped around our arms. And we still have a veil over our face so that we can't see clearly and we can't move fast like we should and freely as we should. And so just as Jesus said, remove those clothes so that he can be free, we have got to say, Lord, remove those grave clothes from me. Take it all away so that I can freely go forward. But what are those grave cloths? Number one, it's your past. Our past keeps us from moving forward. But the thing is, I preached this last night in the jail, was it says in Psalms that God loves us so much that he's taken our transgressions, what? As far as the east is from the west. Our past is covered by the blood of the Lamb. And what is covered by the blood should never be muddled in. But Satan's going to try his best to bring it up to you and say, you can't do that. You can't minister. You did this. You live that kind of lifestyle. You've been here. You've done that. But my God says the past is done. Thank you, Jesus. It's over. It's done. It's covered by the blood of the Lamb. And I am free of that. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. But you see, that past could be those grave cloths that keep us bound. Yes, I'm, I'm, to, I'm in life and I love the Lord, but I can't move forward as I should because it's still haunting me. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe fear is something that's got you bound. Maybe you tried to minister once before and it just didn't work out the way you thought it should. That could keep you bound. There might be some things in your past of religious traditions that might keep you bound. Well, that's just not the way we used to do it. Well, if it's not working now, what makes you think it's going to work tomorrow? I preach barefooted. I got socks on tonight, it's cold. I never had a preacher in my life who preached barefooted, but one day God said, you're standing on holy ground, my brother, take your shoes off. Sure. Some days my big toe pokes through because my socks have holes in them, but that's okay. And God reminded me the other night, I've been wearing shoes for a while while I've been preaching. And God said, I told you, son, whenever you declare my word, take your shoes off. I preached a funeral not too long ago, and there in Stotts and Phelps, when you stand at the podium, there's a line of rows just like this. And as I got up to preach, there was about ten heads that poked around to see if I had shoes on. <laughs> I did. But you know what? That's just a, maybe a silly illustration. But it's something I've had to fight because it's a tradition. The pastor should always have his shoes on and fully dressed with a suit and a tie. But if God's told me to take my shoes off, then I need to take them off because it could keep me bound. That's right. I mean, the way this room is set up tonight could really bother some people. 
because we're not in two sections facing the front, but we're all facing the middle and the speaker's having to walk around in a circle. That could really bother some people. But God spoke that into somebody's spirit that they need to be set up like this. And if they were not willing to be obedient to the Father, then this service would be bound. You know what I'm saying? But Jesus has called us to shake off those grave clothes, whatever they could be. And you know what the grave clothes are. I don't have to go through all of them. We'd be here all night. You know what they are. You know the things that are holding you back. You know the things that are holding you back from being that peculiar people. You know the things that are holding you back from being that drunk person on the Holy Spirit. You know those things that are holding you back from being the river maker. You know those things that are holding you back from doing greater things than what he has done. And tonight is the night that Jesus wants you to shake off those grave clothes yes. and move forward. Yes. Tonight is the night that he wants us as a community to stand up and shake off the grave clothes for this county and the surrounding areas and say, we are here, we are alive, and we are ready to go. Now what I love is Jesus is not the one who rolled the stone away. Jesus called the people to roll the stone away, and then he called them out. My brothers and my sisters, tonight, my job is to roll the stone away. And right now, the Lord is ready to call you to come out of the grave and shake those grave clothes off so that you can enter into 2013 with his resolutions downloaded in your life and ready to go. I want to ask our musicians if you could go to the stage, please. Tonight. See, Matthew 16, 19 says that we have the power and the authority to bind and to loose. The Word says what is bound on earth is bound where? And what is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven, right? So, tonight is the night that some of us need to take the binding cloths off of our arms and bind up the powers of the enemy and send him packing. Tonight is the night that some of you need to come and shake off those grave cloths, pick those linen strips up, bind up the enemy, and send him on his way. And stop haunting you and holding you back from what God has for you. Maybe tonight's the night that you need to bind up pride and send it packing. Maybe tonight's the night that you need to bind up fear because the Word says, I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of what? Power, love, and a sound mind. So tonight, I want us, and I'm including myself tonight, to say, Lord, shake these off of me and set me free. Download into me, God, what it is that you have for me for this year so that I can go forward. I just want to close our eyes tonight and just bow our heads. Thank you, Lord. Lord, you are so good. Praise your holy name. Mm. Praise you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, will you begin speaking into my brothers and my sisters' hearts right now? Holy Spirit, will you begin moving within them? Holy Spirit, will you begin revealing things to them right now? 
will you begin revealing right now things that might be holding them back? closed and our heads bowed. I believe it's so important for us to be honest with ourselves and honest with the Lord. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is just going to be an act of honesty. I'm the only one looking. How many of you right now can say there's something in your life that's been holding you back from doing what God wants you to do? Would you just lift your hand up? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How you would say there's something right now in your life that is holding you back from doing what God wants you to do? Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for showing this to my brothers and my sisters. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want to ask something. Those of you who you know there's something holding you back and you want freedom from that, will you come to this cross right now? Will you come to this cross right now? come to this cross right now. Praise your holy name. Praise your holy name. If you're tired of those linen cloths holding you down and you not experiencing the fullness of life because the word says that you are complete in him. The fullness of life. If you're not experiencing that fullness of life in Him and something's holding you back, would you come up here tonight? Ooh, the anointing is strong in this place. Praise you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Praise your name, Lord. Wow. People are still coming. Are still coming. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's nothing to be afraid of coming tonight. God just wants to love on you. Will you come? Don't be afraid. I still feel that some of your hearts are being pulled right now. God's tugging at your heart. Father, right now, we praise you. You are the God of life. You are the God of creation. You are the God of freedom. Lord, we have rolled the stone back tonight. And you have called these people out, and they have stepped forward. And I declare right now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that every grave cloth be removed from their body right now and from their life in Jesus' name. I speak right now that everything that has been holding them back, every chain be broken right now in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The word says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And I declare over this group of people right now the freedom that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, I apply your blood to every one of them right now. I command every shackle to fall to the ground. I command the past to be washed away in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, I release freedom right now. 
freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Lord. Freedom, Lord. Freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Jesus. Freedom, Jesus. More, Lord. 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 More, Jesus. More, Jesus.